grab my paper a second here. So make sure this thing works. Hello, everyone. How are you? Hello. Yes. Let's give a round of applause. So I just want to say, good afternoon, beautiful and magnificent beings of the multiverse. Yes. Yes. We welcome you, members of the Delaware Art Museum community, and those of you who have traveled further to be here, as well as those present via live stream. I am Salim Ali Cooper, founder of the mobile bookshop, Brevity Bookspace. Beside me is the illustrious Jessa Mendez, lead museum associate and a word-loving and wise writer who has worked tirelessly to bring this event to life. Please give Jessa a round of applause. <laughs> we are both overjoyed to bring you the National Book Foundation's presentation of Rewriting American Memory. Thank you, Stuart Jackson, for your hard work in setting up the auditorium and AV. Thank you, Natalie Green and the incomparable NBF team for showing feats of organization and execution I perceived as unimaginable. Thank you, Clint, Kali, and Dolan for gracing Delaware with your lights, which in their individual nature examines the sharp and smooth of human relations. We would also like to thank the DDOA, as this organization is supported in part by a grant from the Delaware Division of the Arts, a state agency in partnership with the National Endowment for the Arts. The division promotes Delaware art events on DelawareScene.com. We also would like to thank Delaware Humanities for sponsoring yesterday's Wilmington Writers Conference. We would love for you to enjoy the rest of your visit with a stop by Gallery 10 to see In Conversation Will Wilson, our current exhibition that explores the relationship of technology, agency, and identity with specific historical representation of Native peoples in North America. Perhaps you can also take a moment to support the museum store and buy a book today and just maybe get it signed. The night is young. <laughs> in closing, I'd like to recall the privilege to be in this place at this time in the presence of writers who I am sure will give us a clarion call in the air of our current national situation. Let us open ourselves to the possibilities of the truths we have forgotten, those that have been erased and those that reside in some unknown systematically rendered shadow. May today be a reminder to be unsilenced. May today also be a reminder to remain vigilant and may today be a cathartic experience for us all. With that said, please join us in giving a warm welcome to the Director of Programs for the National Book Foundation, Natalie Green. That's why you're never supposed to follow a poet. <laughs> um, but I'll do my very best to keep it really short so we can save time for what you're actually here for, the folks on stage. Like Salim said, I'm Natalie Green, the Director of Programs at the National Book Foundation. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's event, presented in partnership with our friends at the Delaware Art Museum and Brevity Bookspace. So many thanks to Jessa Mendez and Salim Cooper for dreaming and scheming with me from start to finish and gently teasing the many, many emails I've sent along the way. And thanks to Stuart Jackson, Casey Rosario, and AGI Media for making us look and sound pretty. And most importantly, thanks to you all for joining us in person and online. Some of you may know the National Book Foundation as the presenter of the National Book Awards, or what I like to call the shiny sticker on book covers, which has honored the best literature in America since 1950. Through the support of readers like you and the Mellon Foundation, we work to reach readers everywhere, through our education and public programming, online and in person in 46 states and counting. If you're interested in learning more about what we're up to, please visit our website at nationalbook.org and sign up for our monthly newsletter. There's a clipboard on the table right after you exit the theater. Today we're gathered for a conversation with National Book Award honored authors Kali Fajardo Anstein and Clint Smith on rewriting American memory, moderated by author and professor Dolan Perkins Valdez. The authors will read from and chat about their work, and then we'll open up at the end to a few questions from our in-person audience. If you have a question, there's a mic to the front of the stage here. Please form a queue behind it, um, and we'll get through as many as we're able to. 
Following the event, the authors will move over to the signing area upstairs in front of the bookstore with extra thanks to Jessa and the museum store for acting as our bookseller today. And now I'm delighted to introduce our authors. Kali Fajardo Anstein is the author of the national best-selling novel, Woman of Light, and the story collection, Sabrina and Karina, a finalist for the National Book Award and winner of an American Book Award. She is the 2021 recipient of the Addison M. Metcalf Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, and she has written for the New York Times, The Atlantic, Harper's Bazaar, Elle, O, oh, The Oprah Magazine, and elsewhere. I had to tease Kali that I needed a shorter version of her bio because she has so many accolades at this point. I was like, I, it's too much. <laughs> Born and raised in Denver, Colorado, she is the 2022 to 2024 Endowed Chair in Creative Writing at Texas State University. Clint Smith is a staff writer at The Atlantic. He's the author of the narrative nonfiction book, How the Word is Passed, A Reckoning with the History of Slavery Across America, which was a number one New York Times bestseller and long listed for the National Book Award. He is also the author of the brilliant poetry collection, Counting Descent, which won the 2017 Literary Award for Best Poetry Book from the Black Caucus of the ALA and was a finalist for an NAACP Image Award. His writing has been published in The New Yorker, The New York Times Magazine, The Paris Review, and elsewhere. Born and raised in New Orleans, he received his BA in English from Davidson College and his PhD in education from Harvard. And our moderator, Dolan Perkins Valdez, is the New York Times bestselling author of three novels, Winch, Bomb, and Take My Hand. Her short fiction has appeared in the Kenyon Review, Story Quarterly, Story South, and elsewhere. She is the current chair of the board of the Penn Faulkner Foundation. On behalf of the foundation, she has visited nearly every public high school in the District of Columbia to talk about the importance of reading and writing. She is currently associate professor in the literature family. Enjoy the program. How's everybody doing? All right. Good, good, good. Thank you all so much for coming out. Um, it's lovely to be here with such talented writers, and, and I feel very lucky to share the space. Uh, I'm going to do something a little bit different. Um, I'm, as was mentioned, uh, my last book was a book of narrative nonfiction, but uh, I, my origin story of a, as a writer is that of a poet. And so when I'm, for, me, for me, poetry is both the creation of art, but it is also the mechanism through which I do my best thinking. And so when I had the idea for how the word is passed, I first imagined it as a poetry collection. Um, but part of what happens when you write across genres is that sometimes things begin in one form and then end up in another as the project sort of demands a different set of questions to be wrestled with in a different way. Um, so there is a poem that I wrote that helped sort of ground my understanding of what the project was attempting to do. Um, but it, and then what happens is when you're a, a poet writing nonfiction, sometimes you take a poem and you'll like stick it at the end of uh, the section of one of your chapters and turn the stanzas into paragraphs and hope your editor is okay with it. Um, so this is a poem, uh, the poem that sort of was the catalyst to the nonfiction project, but it is also an excerpt from the end of um, one of my chapters. Growing up, the iconography of the Confederacy was an ever-present fixture of my daily life. Every day on the way to school, I passed a statue of PGT Beauregard riding on horseback, his Confederate uniform slung over his shoulder, and his military cap pulled far down over his eyes. As a child, I did not know who PGT Beauregard was. I did not know he was the man who ordered the first attack that opened the Civil War. I did not know he was one of the architects who designed the Confederate battle flag. I did not know he led an army predicated on maintaining the institution of slavery, what I knew is that he looked like so many of the other statues that ornamented the edges of this city, these copper garlands of a past that saw truth as something that should be buried underground and silenced by the soil. After the war, the sons and daughters of the Confederacy reshaped the contours of treason into something they could name as honorable. They called it the lost cause, and it crept its way into textbooks that attempted to cover up a crime that was still unfolding. They told us that Robert E. Lee was an honorable man guilty of nothing but fighting for the state and the people that he loved, that the Southern flag was about heritage and remembering those slain fighting to preserve their way of life. 
But see, the thing about the lost cause is that it's only lost if you're not actually looking. The thing about heritage is that it's a word that also means I'm ignoring what we did to you. I was taught the Civil War wasn't about slavery, but I was never taught how the declarations of Confederate secession had the promise of human bondage carved into its stone. I was taught the war was about economics, but I was never taught that in 1860, the four million enslaved black people were worth more than every bank, factory, and railroad combined. I was taught the Civil War was about states' rights, but I was never taught how the Fugitive Slave Act could care less about a border and spell Georgia and Massachusetts the exact same way. It's easy to look at a flag and call it heritage when you don't see the black bodies buried behind it. It's easy to look at a statue and call it history when you ignore the laws written in its wake. I come from a city that is filled with statues of white men on pedestals and black children playing beneath them, where we played trumpets and trombones to drown out the Dixie song that still whistled in the wind. In New Orleans, there are over 100 schools, roads, and buildings named for Confederates and slaveholders. Every day, I used to walk into buildings named after people who never wanted me to be there. Every time I returned home, I would drive on streets named for those who didn't think of me as human, go straight for two miles on Robert E. Lee, take a left on Jefferson Davis, make the first right on Claiborne, translation, go straight for two miles on the general who slaughtered hundreds of black soldiers who were trying to surrender, take a left on the president of the Confederacy who made the torture of black bodies the cornerstone of his new nation, make the first right on the man who mounted the heads of rebelling slaves on stakes and spread them across the city in order to prevent the others from getting any ideas. What name is there for this sort of violence? What do you call it when the road you walk on is named for those who imagined you under a noose? What do you call it when the roof over your head is named after people who would have wanted the bricks to crush you? Thank you. Thank you so much for that reading, Clint. That was really powerful. Um, I'm excited to be here today. I'm from Colorado, so I, I flew out just this weekend, and I have never been to Delaware before this weekend. <laughs> so um, it's, very, it's very interesting <laughs> so far. Uh, so I, I'm here, I'm going to talk about my first book, Sabrina and Karina, which came out in 2019. But my new book, Woman of Light, just came out this summer. And Woman of Light took over 10 years to write and research, and it's based on the oral tradition in my own family. Um, I am a Chicana of mixed indigenous heritage, so my people have been in the American Southwest um, since pre-statehood, um, and my mother's side since time immemorial, as we're descendants of the Pueblos in northern New Mexico. But I'm also mixed with Filipino and European descent, and when I was growing up, I didn't see any narratives that reflected our complicated ancestry and how long we have been placed in the American Southwest. And I really wanted a novel that would honor that and also honor our history. So I began um, this idea based on my great-grandmother Esther and her sister, my Auntie Lucy's stories of migrating north from southern Colorado to Denver in the 1930s. And this novel is sort of my, my love song to my ancestors, but also to all Chicanos from the Southwest who have had our history ripped away from us and silenced and erased. I'm trying to give our history back. So I'm going to read from a chapter that's set in Denver in 1934, and it is called Justice Cannot See, But Can She Hear? Sometimes when Luce thought about when they first came to Denver, she didn't understand the layout of that world. She was only little. Before, when they had lived in the Lost Territory, she was surrounded by mountains from Huerfano to Trinidad and all the mining camps in between. The mountains were permanent yet shifting, ancient though young, their white peaks reminding Luce of gray hairs while their aspen groves resembled veins. Luce felt partly made of mountains, as if the land was family. But the city was different. Smog and concrete, morning light spilling between stone squeezes, landing on the worn hoods of Model T's resting on Curtis Street. In the evenings, the sun slipped behind the mountains, sinking away with long tentacles of light, reaching over the brickwork city for another chance at brilliance. Maria Josie insisted that Diego and Luce must learn the map, as she had called it, 
and she showed them first around by foot and later by streetcar. She wore good walking shoes and dressed herself and the children in many layers. It tends to heat up, she had said. Another moment, it might hail. The siblings learned to be cautious. It was dangerous to stroll through the mostly white neighborhoods. Their streetcar routes were equally unsafe. There were Ku Klux Klan picnics, Klan races, car cross burnings on the edge of the foothills, flames like tongues licking the canyon walls, hatred reaching all the way to the stars. Luce and Diego were once walking downtown when a man yelled, go back to your own country, and spat at them from a truck window. They were supposed to be learning the map. It was the first time Maria Josie had sent them off alone. Luce had cried, wiping the stranger's hot phlegm from her tiny face, and her brother Diego cursed and held up both arms, but he lowered them cautiously and told Luce that he finally recognized where they were in the city. He pulled his little sister by the sleeve of her oversized dress into a market, a place called Ticus with a ringing of bells. What happened to the little one, a voice called, and Luce saw that it was the older boy, David, the shopkeeper's son, watchful behind the counter. Diego pointed to Luce's wet cheek and asked if his little sister could please use the sink. She was only eight years old and everything in the market storeroom was unlike anything Luce had ever seen before. Shelves of canned food, sacks of flour, heaps of wooden crates. They must be rich, she thought, scrubbing her little face nearly raw with a clean white towel. Where did it happen, David was asking when Luce returned. She pointed to the front door. What color was the truck, David said, stepping down from the counter. He was carrying a baseball bat. He gently took Luce's left hand and walked her to the door, opening it with a wide, sweeping gesture. Which direction? Luce shook her head. She was done crying now. Embarrassed, she held the towel to her face, trying to hide herself from David. I don't know any directions yet. We got lost today. We were trying to learn the map. David softly pulled the towel away from Luce's face. He smiled when she looked at him. He was not a grown-up, but he was not a child, and he was tall and slim-shouldered, a warmth in his gaze. He motioned down the wide avenue between the brick buildings and wire-filled sky. See that, he said? Those are the mountains. They will always be west. Luce looked to the horizon, allowing the line of sunlight to bathe her eyes. And over there, he said, it's flat. That's the prairie land. East. David pointed to the mountains once more. Which direction? West, said Luce. David gestured right. East, said Luce. Good work, he said. Now say this. This is my city. Luce did not say anything, and David nudged her to go on. This is my city, she said quietly. This, David spoke louder, is my city. Luce giggled before she sucked in another breath. This is my city. All right, said David. Now once more like you mean it. This is my city, they yelled together until their voices boomed high and arching, rattling streetcar cables and smoggy windows, soaring between stone tenements and factory tufts. This, Luce repeated, is ours. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Mike! <laughs> Thank you. They said I had the hardest job of all, which is to remember the mic. <laughs> Well, who needs to remember a mic when you remember family stories the way that you do? It's just amazing that I get to be in conversation with both of you about American memory. Can you all hear me good? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> I can't hear myself that well, but that's fine. <laughs> um, what a pleasure it is to be here um, talking about American memory here in Delaware, the first state. Um, <laughs> and also thinking about um, what your projects have in common with excavating these stories, with um, rewriting American memory in so many interesting ways. 
I wanted to begin with the dedications of your books. Um, Clint, you dedicate How the Word is Passed to your children. Kali, you dedicate Sabrina and Karina to your mama and papa, and Woman of Light to your late Grandma Esther and your Auntie Lucy. Okay, I'm louder now. I've heard you call this, Kali, your heart song to your people. I'm interested in this reaching back and reaching forward in these dedications, and I wanted each of you to speak a little bit about the generational significance of these stories, whether to your children or whether to your ancestors. So growing up in Denver, I had this very rich oral tradition in my family. Um, I heard story after story of their walk north to the city. And they left southern Colorado because my great-grandmother's father was a Belgian miner. He never married her indigenous mother, which was pretty common. I mean, men came in, they needed to find somebody to uh, sleep with, essentially. And he didn't take care of his children after he abandoned the family which was sort of a death sentence in that part of the world at that time. So I heard a lot of stories of their survival and their resilience when they walked north and they came up to Denver. One of the issues was that I would then go to school and we would learn about Colorado history and it was all about Molly Brown and the Titanic and all these rich, wealthy people that lived in these mansions. And I thought, well, that's really weird because my family has been here since time immemorial. We, we are pre-statehood because we've always been here. And there's no mention of us as an organized people with an organized history. There was no cohesion. Um, and so from the time I was a teenager, I knew that I wanted to be a novelist. And I also knew that I wanted to provide that narrative for my people and to give us some sort of glimpse into a collective history. Uh, my godmother is 85 years old, and she's my Auntie Lucy's um, only living daughter. She's a queer woman, um, and she worked as an electrician her entire life, her working life. And uh, she currently is, she's struggling with terminal cancer. Mm -hmm. And one of the greatest gifts of writing Woman of Light is that my godmother lived long enough to read it. She read it twice, and she said that she looked up to heaven and she goes, look, look, ancestors, we're in a book. And she, she thanked, you know, the, she thanked the ancestors for giving those stories, but she told me her whole life she had to hide parts of herself, whether it was being Mexican-American and indigenous or whether it was being a lesbian. And she, she's just so proud of this book. Um, and to me, that's the greatest achievement of of Woman of Light is that I've been able to broadcast our stories in this large way. You know, this book began in so many ways in, uh, in 2017 when I was watching several Confederate statues come down in my hometown in New Orleans, these statues of P.G.D. Beauregard, Jefferson Davis, Robert E. Lee, as I said. And as I was watching these statues come down, I was thinking about what it meant that I grew up in a majority black city in which there were more homages to enslavers than there were to enslaved people. And thinking about what are the implications of that? What does it mean that to get to school, I had to go down Robert E. Lee Boulevard. To get to the grocery store, I had to go down Jefferson Davis Highway. That my middle school was named after a leader of the Confederacy. That my parents still live on a street today named after someone who owned hundreds of enslaved people. Because the thing is that symbols and names and iconography aren't just symbols. They're reflective of the stories that people tell. And those stories shape the narratives that communities carry. And those narratives shape public policy. And public policy shapes, as we know, the material conditions of people's lives. Which isn't to say that taking down a 60-foot tall statue of Robert E. Lee is going to suddenly get rid of the racial wealth gap. But it does help us recognize the sort of ecosystem of ideas and stories and narratives that give us context to better understand the way certain communities have been disproportionately intentionally harmed throughout American history. And so, I was thinking about that and I was thinking about, as I watched these statues come down, how I never learned about the history of slavery in any way that was commensurate with the impact and legacy that it had on my city, on my state, on my country. I mean, New Orleans was at one point the, the largest and busiest slave market in the country. And I think about my education around slavery and how that was never part of the conversation. I was like, how am I supposed to understand this city, this place that raised me, this place that is my home, without understanding the this foundational piece of like what made it what it was. And I think for me in terms of, you know, how I was thinking and orienting the book, you know, the dedication uh, served as a reminder that I, what I was trying to do was write the sort of book I wish that I had had. You know, and I think there are so many of us who try to do that work. And, you know, Toni Morrison, as we know, has the sort of old adage that so many of us paraphrase, where if there is a book that you want to write that hasn't been written yet, then you need to be the one to write it. Um, and I really tried to write the sort of book that I 
felt like I needed in my like 10th grade American history class. The kind of book that like 15 year old Clint really needed and really wanted that would have given me the language, that would have given me the toolkit, that would have given me the sort of intellectual framework to understand that the reason one community looks one way and another community looks another way is not because of the people in those communities, but it's because of what has been done to those communities generation after generation after generation. Um, and so in dedicating it to my children, I think it's, I'm trying to, at the same time, almost dedicate it to like the younger version of myself and hope that my children are entering the world and, and are able to move through their own education with, with text and with books and with ideas that um, can more firmly ground them in an understanding of why this country looks the way that it does um, so that they don't have to uh, feel the same sense of sort of confusion or paralysis or uh, the sort of lack of understanding that I felt like I had that I tried to make up for when I got older. It's interesting because I have two daughters um, and I feel like their whole lives I've been trying to educate them on black history. And not only do I feel like I educate them, I educate their teachers, I educate their friends. And part of what I have been trying to do, and, and, and I'm mentioning this because while reading your book I had this epiphany, and I just wanna hear what you think about it, was part of what I've been trying to do is teach them this is not just a story of victimhood, that this is a story of defiance and rebellion and survival and intelligent scheming, right? Things that we aren't usually taught about it. But after reading your book, I had this other revelation, which um, I thought to myself, one of the things that I need to do more of and what I think maybe we need to do more of is not shying away from placing the blame where it's due. That we need to be more forthright in saying, these were corrupt and immoral people who enacted this harm. Because quite often when you leave that out and you have a black child in school, particularly in a school where they're the minority, they're carrying the weight of the shame. And so I wanted to ask you about discomfort, and, I'm, and I think I'm coming to you with this question too, Kali. There's a certain discomfort in rewriting and correcting this history. What are your thoughts about the kind of discomfort that people might feel when you speak truth to power? Yeah, thank you for that question. I'm thinking of a couple of things. Um, one is this sense of, you know, I think often about this James Baldwin essay, um, a piece he wrote in 1964, or published in 1964, called A Talk to Teachers. And it's, in it, he's, it's based on a speech that he gave to a group of New York City educators in 1963. And in it, one of the things that he says uh, is that the role of the teacher is to help the black child understand that even though the world tells them that they are criminal, the role of the teacher is to help that child understand that it is the history and it is the society that created the conditions that that child is forced to grow up in that is the real criminal. And for many of us, that, that feels intuitive, especially now in 2022, given that our, our sort of collective lexicon and understanding of the, the history and manifestations of racism is in a more, largely in a more sophisticated space than it was 10 years ago at the beginning of the Black Lives Matter movement. But I think we can forget how it's not necessarily intuitive to so many young people in the same way. And I think so much of my work generally, and, and certainly in the context of this book, was shaped by having been a high school teacher. You know, I was a high school English teacher for a few years before I went to graduate school. And I just remember, I remember both the feeling that I had when I was in high school, feeling like I didn't have the language, feeling like I didn't have the, the understanding that I needed. And I experienced that in the same way when I was an educator. And it felt, I feel, I think, you know, I taught a school majority black and Latinx students um, majority free and reduced lunch. I mean, the same story that exists across public schools across this country. Um, and I feel like it was, I came into the classroom, especially in a moment where we were having a lot of conversation around grit and a lot of conversation around like students gotta work hard, they gotta push through, they gotta overcome. And like, to be clear, I want my students to work hard. I want my students to push through, I want them to overcome. But my big thing is that if we're only telling students that they need to work hard and overcome, and not actually giving them the context to understand what they need to, or what it is they actually need to overcome, or what has created the conditions that they have to overcome in the first place, they start to believe that they have to overcome something about themselves, or that they have to overcome something about their community. And, and I saw that manifesting itself in all sorts of ways in my students, and it's like, no, it's, there's nothing that you or your parents or your grandparents have done to deserve the conditions that you are growing up in. This is the result of decades and centuries of policy and judicial decisions and legislation. 
that have saturated so many of these communities with violence and poverty. And part of my work, I felt, was to help give students that same language and that same history to understand the history of housing discrimination in their community, understand the history of mass criminalization and incarceration in their community. I taught a lot of undocumented students to understand the history of immigration uh, in this community and in our country, to give, just give people a sort of understanding to have, to give context to the idea that they should work hard so that they don't feel as if they are trying to, that they need to escape something about themselves or escape their community in order to be successful. Um, and then the second piece of that with regard to discomfort, I think, you know, my book focuses a lot on the docents and tour guides and folks who, who are sort of curating the experience at these uh, museums and cemeteries and institutions. And part of what they do really well is a sort of, there's like a both andedness to their work. There's a sort of extension of grace and generosity, which is to say when you go to Monticello, uh, David, the tour guide I spent time with there, he's not going to judge you for what you don't know. But there is the expectation of, of accountability and responsibility. So he's going to extend grace and extend generosity, but also demand that like, if he presents you with information that is uncomfortable, that runs counter to all of the other stories of America you've been told, that run counter to the stories of Jefferson that you were previously carrying, there is a sort of mutual expectation in this space that you are going to sit with that. And you're going to carry that, even if it sort of pushes you to recalibrate your entire sense of this country and your relationship to it. The only way it works is, is the sort of mutual um, contract that kind of implicitly exists in, in those spaces. But, but I think the important part is that people go into those spaces and don't feel as if they are going to be judged or lambasted or harangued for not knowing certain pieces of information. Um, and that felt really important to me and I wanted the book not to be a polemic, not to be didactic, but like I, it, I wanted it to be honest about my own journey and I wanted the reader to be on a journey alongside me because this book was not written by somebody who began this project as an expert on the history of slavery. I wrote it because I felt like I didn't understand the history of slavery in a way that I should have. And so the book is an attempt to bring the reader alongside me on this both physical uh, journey and a sort of intellectual journey and historical one um, so that we are sort of together learning about these things that we all feel like we should have learned a long time ago. Wow, powerful. And Kali, I, I want to ask you the same question in the context of Woman of Light. You are unapologetic in depicting um, income inequality. You have a, a, a young socialist lawyer, David, who we met in the um, excerpt that you just read from, who's fighting on behalf of exploited workers and victims of police violence. You depict entire communities who are struggling with very simple things like hunger, right? And you know, I really felt it was a searing indictment of the early decades of the 20th century. Um, and I felt reading your book, and I, and I always say, I haven't read everything, okay? But I have never read this story. And um, I just wanted you to also speak to the discomfort that might be evoked by speaking truth to power about what actually happened there. Yeah. Well, I think to answer that question, I, I want to back up and give some context about me and my journey to becoming a writer. Um, a lot of my work deals explicitly with shame. And I had a lot of shame growing up. I felt that we were, we were too poor. Uh, my family members were queer. Um, we had a lot of kids or seven siblings in my family. And everywhere I would go in these institutional settings, I would, I'd be, made to feel small and like we didn't matter. Um, I ultimately dropped out of high school at the urging of my own English teacher. She pulled me aside and she said, you might be a pretty good writer someday. She was holding a paper I wrote on Flannery O'Connor, but she said, I don't think you're cut out for school because you keep missing my class. And I, um, I went out into the hallway and I cried and I cried and I went home. And that next day I went and took the GED and I enrolled in summer classes at the local state college. Um, I never met anyone who had been a professional writer that had a contract from New York City Publishing. That didn't seem like a possibility. And when I decided that I wanted to be a Chicana and Chicano Studies minor because I was fascinated by our history, there was somebody um, from the English department who told me, well, how many classes is that going to take? It's probably just like half a class, right? And you get all the information. And so my whole life I was being told, you're small, you don't matter, nothing matters. But then I'm looking at my family history and I'm looking at these incredible records and all these stories that go back to the Pueblos and I'm realizing, no, this is big. 
This is a big American story. Um, there's a reason why people in my mother's side, when they would pass away, we would have to scrounge money together to buy them plots. There's a reason why they're losing all their houses. There's a reason why they're dying young of illnesses that they caught at work because of the dangerous conditions. And so I realized very young that I needed to position myself to learn as much as possible so I could prove that the story mattered. And that's a horrible thing to have to, to realize at 15 years old. Like I should have been just like listening to punk rock and going to concerts and being carefree. But instead I was like, how do I overthrow the Colorado state government's like historical, <laughs> like, how do I do this? Um, and it, it didn't really end with writing Woman of Light. In fact, it intensified. So I, I start writing this novel and I'm having to go into archives and I start noticing something very sad. And that is that we're not in the archives. Um, and I remember I was at the Center for Southwest Studies, uh, a museum in Southern Colorado, and I asked to see a box of oral history tapes. And first of all, I get an email back saying, do you even know how to use a cassette tape? Like, why would we let you look at these? And I was like, what? I, I, of course I know how to use a cassette tape. And then when I got the box, everything was out of order and some of them actually were destroyed. And they had no um, accountability for this. There was nothing we could do. And I said, okay, well that's like, this is all you have in your collection about my people. Like, what am I supposed to do? And so I wrote like a, at the time I thought it was a very scathing email, but when I look back, it was, you know, I was very gentle. I said, well, why are you not prioritizing our stories? Um, and another thing happened when I was trying to look at wedding dresses from the 1930s, because there's a beautiful wedding in this novel. And uh, they asked me, why do you need to see this? Who are you? What are your credentials? So I said, I'm just a writer, you know, I just, I just want to look. And the entire time I was looking at the wedding dress, I was told, uh, not only could I not touch it, which I understood, but I had to stay a certain amount of feet back, and I was being watched the entire time, like very aggressively. And all of those things sort of, they cut off your access to your history, but it also shows you that's not directly the place you need to go to. And so I pivoted away from the institutions, and I started interviewing my elders, and I started interviewing community elders. And that really changed my perspective on the shame that I was feeling. I thought, okay, well, my elders have robust stories, they have artifacts, they have everything I need in their homes, and I'm not gonna be embarrassed anymore that it's not necessarily in the official archives, and it's not necessarily something that they want me to access. Now, since I've established myself and I've written two books, um, I, my family has been asked if we would put artifacts into the State History Museum. You better believe I had some words. <laughs> um, and I told Mama, I was like, Mama, this is it. Like, you cannot sell our items for free because she just wanted to give them away for free. And I was like, no, our wealth is our stories because they took away our ability to have other kinds of wealth. That's right. Oh. I'm, so, I'm so glad you defended and told your mama, right, girl, we have to do this. <laughs> I'm like, stop giving them away. Yes, yes. I don't know if you ever read that story, Everyday Use by Alice Walker, but y'all remember that story where one of the sisters comes to get all the artifacts and, oh, ooh, you gotta read that story. Okay. Let's talk about place. Um, clearly, place is central to y'all's work. I mean, uh, for you, Kali, you are drawing on Denver, but also just Southern Colorado, Northern New Mexico, um, beautiful, portraits, even from the excerpt you read about the mountains on one side, the prairie on the other. Uh, you, Clint, uh, I was intrigued by the map of your book from Texas to Louisiana to Virginia to New York to Senegal, drawing these connections that I'd never considered. I'm curious about what happens to the American map when we begin reframing the American story. <laughs> it, like, brilliant question. Uh, <laughs> so I would hold up Woman of Light, but it's over there. Woman of Light actually opens with a map as my title page, and it was really important to me that I had a map because I wanted people to make sure that they knew they were in the American Southwest, and despite that desire for them to know that, I saw some trade reviews that still set my book down on the current Mexico-US border. So I knew it would be hard for the collective imagination to realize that there are Latinos that have always been North, um, and we are mixed indigenous people. So I made sure that I put it in a map, but then it became a little tricky because maps tell you more about the person who made the map than the actual land. 
So I'm looking at all these maps and I'm trying to find one that would actually accurately depict the land that I come from and I'm starting to realize that the maps, they grow and they shift depending on who is colonizing and who is being colonized. Uh, but I think one of the important aspects of my work, especially for Denver and greater Colorado, is that it doesn't necessarily have to do with the state institution of Colorado. Um, if you notice at the beginning of the novel, it's also dedicated to the people of Denver. Not to Denver. I did not want this official city thinking I wrote them a book. Uh, this is for the people. And through the process of writing both Sabrina and Karina and Woman of Light, I've realized that it's the people and their lives and in their interaction with the landscape that make up the character of a place. And that the official map making and the ideology and all of the social structures on top of it, those can come and go depending on who is in power. But it's actually the people on the ground interacting with the world and that is the two things that I think create the most truthful map. And that map doesn't exist. That map is held inside of your heart. That's a bar, man. <laughs> <laughs> I've had a lot of time on this. Oh, I got you. That map is in your heart. It seems like it should be on a t-shirt. Um, you know, for me, place felt so essential. And it, it, it's essential for me because I, I really believe that you experience history differently when you put your body there. Um, that when you are putting your feet in the soil, when you are putting your room or your, your body in the room, when you're putting your hands in the earth, um, you experience the, the stakes and the history of that place in a different way. I always remember standing in a slave cabin at the Whitney Plantation in Louisiana. And the Whitney is such an important place because it's one of the only uh, plantations in the country uh, that focuses sort of singularly on the experience of the enslaved rather than doing this sort of gone with the wind tour of the, of the plantation in the house. Um, and it's surrounded by a constellation of plantations where people continue to hold weddings and where, you know, I talk to wedding planners and where people use the, uh, the slave cabins as bridal suites and, you know, all of this really unsettling stuff which makes the, the Whitney's space in that orbit all the more, um, all the more important. And I remember when I was standing in a slave cabin that was an original slave cabin, right? It's not a replica. Like, this was one of the original cabins that were um, uh, inhabited by enslaved people on that land. You just, you, you feel, like you see the, the way that the light sort of seeps in through the cracks in the roof. You feel your feet sort of like moving across the, the wooden floor as it moans beneath you. You, you feel the air sort of s slide through um, the space and you realize how susceptible to elements you would have been. And I, and I think the other thing is that for so long I thought about slavery in the context of, like through the lens of the sort of physical spectacle of cruelty. Right, it was then because in some ways that's the most famous depiction of it. Right, it's the famous scene in Roots. It's like the thing that we see, and it's a sort of very like hetero masculine physical cruelty, like somebody is being beaten bare chested. And that, to be sure, that is an, an enormous part of what slavery was. But until I wrote this book, and until I was in that cabin in the Whitney Plantation, I didn't think as much about family separation. Uh, and when, as I was writing this book, when we, my wife and I had two kids. We were like now five and three, but. They were very young at that time, and I just had this moment where I kind of closed my eyes, and I thought about what it would mean if I went to sleep with my family in my home, and then I woke up the next day, and my children were gone. And I had no idea where they went. I had no idea who had taken them. I had no idea if I'd ever see them again. And then you have this moment standing in this place. I feel like it can only happen in a place like that, where you have a much more acute sense that like this was the omnipresent threat that hung over millions of people across generations every single day of their lives, that you could be separated from the people you love at any second for any reason. And I just thought about this sort of constant psychological terror that that creates in, in, someone's, um, in someone's life. And, and you realize that the story of like why people ran away or didn't run away is so much more complex than what they had the physical ability or dexterity to do, that it was about, you know, if you run away, something might happen to your husband, something might happen to your wife, something might happen to your parents, something might happen to your children, something. So, so all that's to say, like, for me, there's the going to the places and the sort of creating a sort of physical map of, 
of what these places were. You know, it's about, you know, the book is about eight places, but it could have been about 100,008, right? The scars of slavery are etched into the landscape all around us. Um, but it felt really important to me because there's something about being there that evokes a different sense of, a, a different sense of proximity, which I think thus creates a different sense of empathy um, for, for what that must have been like. I really felt your, I mean, you know, going back to the discomfort issue, your discomfort in some of those situations, that's one of the things that I loved about your book was that structure of you doing these tours because I, I remember doing a tour at the Confederate Museum in Richmond, Virginia, which is no longer um, there, but um, in that way that it was when I went, but I went by myself and I almost fainted. Like I had an out-of-body experience. So it's difficult sometimes for us to walk into those hostile spaces. Uh, last question for both of you. Um, I wanted to ask you about how, because it seems like to me that both of you in different ways are really concerned with how we access memory and how we frame memory and not just in what we remember, right? So for you, uh, Kali, um, you are using this beautiful nonlinear structure. You have a character who can access through her visions both the past and the future, which I loved. Um, you also um, suggest, you know, that there's memory in the land, right? There are a lot of ways in which memory is, you know, you talked about the archive being silent, but you really tap into all the ways that our people, people of color, in, you know, all over the world have accessed memory, which was not through an archive, right? <laughs> um, and so I wanted to ask about how we remember also to you, Clint, um, because, I mean, you just mentioned the Whitney Plantation. There were questions there about how we remember that space, right? And, and what are the motivations, for example, of the guy that runs that plantation and whether it should be a tourist destination even. So I just wanted to end with this fa final question on like, what is the importance to how we access and how we frame the memory and not just what we remember? Well, I think with Luce, um, so Luce is a seer in the novel and this is something that is based on my Auntie Lucy. Um, when she first came to the city as a young girl, one of the ways that she made money is that she was a tea leaf reader. And she also sold flappers uh, joints. <laughs> so, <laughs> so she would go out on the streets and she would read fortunes and sell marijuana. And <laughs> that was my family history. Um, but you know, their premonitions were very common in my family, um, dreams, that kind of thing. And that was a form of knowledge that, again, the establishment would tell us it wasn't real. It wasn't real that my mother would have a dream that one of her children was in a car accident. It wasn't real that my auntie had shooting pains all down her arm and then found out that her husband had fallen while working on a tree. Um, none of that was, was supposed to be actual knowledge. So growing up having that sort of extra layer, I started to realize you know, there's a reason why that kind of knowledge was sort of taken away from us. It's because it also alerts us to injustice. And it happened time and time again that I would get a bad feeling. I would see um, my mother being treated a certain way by police officers or a store clerk. And this was when I was very, very young and suddenly I would have that bad feeling. And so when I was developing Luce as a seer, someone who can both access the future a little bit, you know, sometimes she gets her tea leaf reading wrong. Um, but it's, it's a really radical thing that she's able to access the ancestor's story. So a woman of light is told in two timelines, the 1890s and also the 1930s. Um, the family in the 1890s, they are sharpshooters, they own a Wild West show, um, they're just this, these incredible performers. But there is a act of murder and that severs, it's also a land grab that happens sort of halfway through the novel, that severs the family's ability to know any of that history. So the fact that Luce can go back through that curtain of severing and pull out those histories and those memories, that's a radical act because we, all of that has been taken away from us. So when I was developing her and I was thinking about, well, what does it mean that my family actually has records? What does it mean that my great grandma would incessantly tell us stories about all the things that had happened to her that were important for us to remember? 
You know, in my first book, Sabrina and Karina, this is when I first started working with historical fiction. There's a story in there called Sisters, and it's about a woman who was blinded while on a date in the 1950s. I was urged by an editor to actually remove that story from Sabrina and Karina because it was too violent, quote unquote. And I was at the Grand Canyon when I got this email, which was very majestic because I got to stand at the edge of the Grand Canyon and really reflect on the fact, why do I want to pass that internal family memory on to the greater collective? And my decision was that it's really important that people look these injustices in the eye, especially when this has been erased over and over again. So I decided to keep sisters in Sabrina and Karina, and I believe it's what led me to being able to write Woman of Light so fully because I started doing the research. And I will tell you over and over again, people come to me at my signing tables and they say, I was really impacted by sisters. That happened to my auntie, that happened to my cousin, that happened to one of my great grandmas. And I'm like, wow, like the fact that so many of us have these stories of great violences enacted upon our bodies and that we have to hide them out of shame uh, writing these kinds of memories and putting them out there for other people to access, I think sort of lessens the shame, but also provides us with a framework to be able to talk about it. And then ultimately the goal is to be able to heal. And I'll just end by saying, I think that one of the ways that our books are in conversation in so many ways is that we really sort of elevate and take seriously the legitimacy of oral histories and like what that, that well, the, the archive is not just the piece of paper or the letter that was written or the, the document from the census, but it is also like your grandmother's stories. It's your great grandfather's stories. It's the thing that your uncle told you when you were sitting on his lap. It's that these things that don't always have the sort of institutional affiliation um, that might legitimate their, uh, their existence as a primary source document. Um, but but that are essential to us, especially for coming from groups of people who've not always been able to have their histories written down for one way or another, uh, re one reason or another. Um, I think for me, you know, there's a long history of, of um, the oral histories, a slave oral histories, um, and through the Federal Writers Project of 1936 to 1938, the lots of HBCUs collected oral histories um, over the course of the early 20th century, um, and you know, for a group of people who weren't able, by law, because they weren't allowed to read and write, to write their stories down, these are incredibly important, especially because until the Civil Rights Movement, the only sort of stories of slavery that historians took seriously were the stories written by former enslavers and their children. Um, it's all the more important that we take seriously, um, and I think that n more institutions, like places like Monticello, places like Whitney, um, are taking seriously the sort of oral histories that have been passed down through the generations um, of uh, formerly enslaved people um, and their descendants as, as a way of shaping the sort of institutional responsibility of those places and also of giving us a fuller sense of what the history of slavery in my context was, was like. Because, you know, as I talk about in the book, one of the things that happens is that when you only study the story of you know, Frederick Douglass, or you only study the narrative of Harriet Tubman, you're getting a very specific slice of an enslaved experience. And like, those are the two of the most remarkable people that the universe has like, ever created. And so it's great to like, read the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass, but it's also not gonna give you a sense of what life was like for like, your ordinary enslaved person in Louisiana, or Georgia, or Mississippi. It's not a coincidence that the two most famous enslaved people were from Maryland. Right, where like their proximity to the North, their proximity to freedom, or an ostensibly free place, was much uh, closer than that of someone who lived in Mississippi, Louisiana, Alabama, which shaped the sort of lives they were able to create, which shaped the way they were able to escape. Um, and I think it's just really important, you know, for me it was really important to make sure that when we're thinking of what resistance looked like, when we're thinking of what um, uh, a full, fully embodied life of an enslaved person looked like, that we're not only thinking of the most famous versions of that, but that we're also thinking of the people who, who maybe, who didn't escape, who didn't run away, who didn't learn how to read and write, but who, who were born into what were just unfathomable circumstances and tried to make a meaningful life for themselves and their family in the midst of that. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's one of the most beneficial things that the, the spending time with those narratives did for me.
Thank you. So I'm going to ask how much time do we have for audience questions? Two audience questions. Sorry, we went over. <laughs> you can ask the rest in the signing line or online. We're all available on social media. Anybody want to come down and ask a pressing question that is just on your mind? Okay, you, you, you don't even have to come down if you want me to repeat it. Okay. I'm going to draw like that because I want to ask questions. I want to say, participate. I got it. Yeah, right. What do you want when you write this book? Thank you so much for coming and talking. When you write this book, what do you want the reader to do next? How do you perceive the reader reaction, not just in the moment of the reading and the finishing, but in the closing and in the moving on? What do you hope? And I think I'm going to just repeat it real quickly for the audiovisual pe people. What do you want the reader to do when they finish reading your book? Yeah. You know, for me, I'm less interested in like a specific action as much as what I hope. Like when, when I finish a book that really, not like when I finished Kali's book, it gave me this remarkable sense of like curiosity and humility. I think I was like, man, there's so, there's so many more American stories I don't know. Because I similarly had never read a story like that. I never read a book like that with the characters from that set of uh, American experiences. And I think for me, it feeds a sense of curiosity um, about wanting to learn more about that period of history. It gives me a sense of humility to remind me that like, there's always more that even the most studied of us can continue to learn about this place we call home. Um, and also just enhances a sense of, you know, I'm, I'm not someone who says like books are important because they increase empathy because I think they can sometimes feel transactional. Like, but, but I do think sometimes when you finish a book that it, sometimes at its best, it can expand your capacity for empathy, um, which I think ultimately makes us more thoughtful and generous people um, as we move through the world. My question is a very simple one, but I would expect that your books will probably be banned. Okay, so I would like to know what, what anyone can do and how we can in any way overcome that type of, of situation. Thank you for that premonition that I hope. <laughs> Hello? Did they, okay, okay. I, that was very scary, that was like lightning. It was like um, right after you said <laughs> premonition yeah, too. I was, I was like, like please, don't, <laughs> please don't ban our books. The book banning um, people. Yeah, okay, that was very scary. Uh, okay, well, my books have not been banned yet, but I've been joking that like they, they could get banned. And okay, one, one thing that it's important to think about is I was a bookseller for over 10 years, and whenever um, a new book would get banned or challenged in the Colorado school districts, my bookstore would create like a table that was like, we're highlighting this banned book. <laughs> and like, we're gonna sell as many as possible. So one of the ways that you can sort of support these books is make sure you're purchasing them. And maybe you could do, if you have enough uh, funds, maybe you could do sort of like a classroom buy and sort of hand them out in unofficial ways. Um, but ultimately, it's the, it's the school boards and your local politicians. So you need to vote, obviously we all know that. But in terms of, <laughs> In terms of trying to get these books into people's hands, your librarians, your teachers, and your booksellers are very important people to go to. Um, and make sure that you're supporting those institutions, especially independent bookstores, um, because they are so um, localized. They're, they're going to be able to curate a list, like these are the books that are being challenged right now. Um, I, my books, I don't think, are popular enough to get banned. <laughs> so it also means that they've, they've risen to a level where there's a real threat perceived. Um, but every day I'm wondering, is that going to happen to me? Uh, and ultimately, it, it just depends on who is in power. So we gotta make sure that we're starting small on the very local level. 
Um, and if you hear of anything that's happening um, within your community, if a book's starting to get challenged, maybe read that book right away and figure out ways, how do I get this into more people's hands? And also question, why is it being banned? It's, it's not enough to say, oh, it has um, sex or racism. Or, you gotta look exactly what, what is happening here that is challenging these people that wanna ban books. Um, do you have any other uh, suggestions? Because I would love to hear them too. No, I think I think you really tackled it. I mean, it's it's both the sort of um, macro and micro level engagement, right? I think it is very much the sort of in, like it makes a difference when banned books. There's a sort of uh, critical mass of folks who then purchase them um, because it doesn't that you know ultimately publishing companies are like they're businesses and they go you know they care a lot about sales and so if they see people responding to a ban by supporting that book and buying that book, then they are not, you don't want publishers to be scared to publish books like that again. Yeah. But like if they continue to be bought, then the incentive is to continue to, um, to publish books uh, that are doing a similar sort of work. And, and yeah, I think it's, you know, it's one of those things where I, I, it's not always like the super sexy thing, but like it really, the folks who are showing up at the school board meetings, the folks who, you know, we've heard so much about like critical race theory and, and all this stuff, like, those are often just like the loudest folks, right? And I think sometimes people who are sympathetic to who I, who I imagine that many of us in this room are, what our sort of political sensibilities are, we are less likely to show up in those spaces um, and less likely to organize in the same way that folks on the other side do. Um, and so I think that that organizing is is really important. And again, that can be on like a on a sort of community based level with like organizing book clubs of banned books. And it can also be on a sort of more explicitly political level, right? Making sure that like a critical mass of folks are showing up to the school board. So it's not only voices from one side who are inundating school board members. Because even the most sympathetic school board members, even the school board members who are most um, interested in making sure that like we have the books that people are trying to ban um, in our libraries, in our schools, if they are only inundated with one very angry message from one side all the time and there's no one ever showing up from the public to, to uh, present the uh, position of the other side um, or present the position of folks who are, who are, again, interested in making sure that we're keeping as many of these books inside of these schools and, and libraries as possible, and then it becomes increasingly harder for them to, to do, do their job and to effectively make sure that they have the, the, the public, the sort of public support and the political capital because of that public support um, in order to make sure that they can uh, do their job. Thank you. Ma these books aren't banned. So buy these books today and support these writers. Thank you.